So I go 18 hours most days without eating anything. And I literally can visualize my body using body fat as mm -hmm. energy through those hours that I'm not consuming calories. So what would you say are the big levers that people can pull day to day to slow the rate at which they age, prevent disease, fight inflammation, fight belly fat, all those things that we're all perennially fighting, right? Yeah, that's a long list. You just you just gave me a long it's list a long of things. List, and not one, there's no one thing that does it all. But I would say that, um, you know, number one, just moving, moving around as much as you can all day is probably... Uh, the thing that's missing for most people's lives. The fact that people go to the gym and do a 45-minute workout three times a week or they, you know, they, get, they get on their Peloton and do something for, for an hour a couple mm -hmm. times a week doesn't really fulfill this human requirement that we have, this genetic expectation that we have that we should be moving all day long, whether it's walking long distances, whether it's standing instead of sitting, whether it's um, being on the phone and talking and having a, a conference call on the phone while you're out, you know, walking in nature, whatever it is, I feel like that that people have kind of uh, assumed that just going to the gym is enough movement, and the rest they've covered them, their bases for the rest of the day. And so, and it's not about burning calories. It's not about like, okay, how many steps did my watch say I took today, or how many calories does my device suggests that I burn. It's just about the movement. It's about putting your muscles and your joints through different ranges and planes of motion as much as you can throughout the day. That's one of the reasons that in some of the societies, uh, particularly Asian societies, where you see people doing Qigong or Tai Chi, they're 80 years old, but they're out there and they're not you know, punching at a bag and they're not doing aerobics. They're going through every possible plane and range that they can do. And it's really a beautiful dance that they're doing as part of this, I think, this human requirement that our genes, you know, sort of expect of us. Hmm. But would you say that, so it's not enough to just like have your hour gym session three or four times a week. You got to be, you got to stay active in body movement in your day to day. Yeah, I, but would you also say conversely that it's not enough just to move and to stay active? There needs to be some resistance training sure. to where you're fighting against gravity? No, no, for sure. There has to be some um, some element of resistance training. You have to you have to work on building um, you know, muscle, muscle mass. Um, and that's that's a thing that uh, I started writing this about this twenty years ago with the primal blueprint. I said, look, there's basically three things you need to do in terms of movement. One, move around a lot at a low level of output, a low level of aerobic activity. Number two, lift heavy things, which which we sort of defined as at least twice a week, go in the gym and, and do resistance training. And once a week, sprint. Do something that raises your heart rate to its absolute max a couple of times in a session, um, but only do that once a week. It's not like you need to be doing these things on a regular basis. Mm. But those seem to be the three categories that best uh, achieve a level of fitness and health uh, because you know I was a fitness freak for a long time and the fitter I got the less healthy I got so there is a point at which fitness and health do not run in parallel parallel lines up a graph hmm. they diverge so the uh, again th this idea that find a lot of ways to move at a low level of activity don't count the calories just just think in terms of moving um, at least twice a week, but probably not more than three times a week, go to the gym and lift heavy things with the intent of building muscle mass, of improving metabolic flexibility through that. Uh, and then once a week or once every 10 days, uh, do some form of sprinting. And it doesn't have to be sprinting like running on the track. It could be it could be on a, a salt bike, 30 seconds on a salt bike. It could be on a, a Versa climber. It could be on a uh, just on a regular uh, stationary bike, just going mm. all out on the on a bike as as hard as you can. Yeah, I yeah. super appreciate that. When you go to the gym and you are resi when you are like r practicing resistance training, yeah. how intensely are you lifting? Like, how close to failure are you getting these days? So, so you know, I, I I can't anymore. I can't uh, I can't justify going close to failure because the risk of injury is too high. Mm. So I'm 70 years old now. I've been doing this my whole life. So I'm I'm actually <laughs> cruising on my genetics a little bit, and I'm cruising on my lifetime of having done this. So it doesn't take that much effort for me to maintain what I have. Still, I'd like to improve in certain areas, um, but the idea of uh, of going to uh, maximum effort or or going to failure, it's it's not necessary. There's a concept called time under load or time under tension. Uh, so you could instead of doing 
uh, you know, 100 pounds 10 times, you could do 50 pounds 20 times, and you do the same amount of work. Hmm. You know, it's still 1,000 pounds that you've put through through space. So there's a range in there uh, that you can, um, you know, sort of optimize the the work that you're doing with the notion that you want to recover fully, so you don't want to court injury. I found that I can't lift more than once every four days now because I can't recover enough. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that I, I could lift every day if I wanted to, but not the way that's going to prompt my body to respond by building stronger muscles or mm. building more power, right? If you, really, if you, if you, there's a point at which you, you do the effort and you do a little bit of damage, but not so much that you get, get, get injured, but enough that it takes you a while to recover from it so that you build back stronger so that you shouldn't be able to do this every day. That's, that's a mark of, well, it, your body's already adapted to, knows, it knows how to do this. Yeah. So that's why I say lift twice a week is probably the, you know, at, at least in my, if my general template for most people, if you can just lift sort of full body twice a week, again, move around a lot, Dive your diet in because diet is, you know, 80% of your body composition happens as a result of the food choices you make. Get plenty of sleep. I don't apologize for the fact that I get nine hours of sleep sometimes. You know, mm. I just, uh, I relish my sleep and I'm not, you know, anxious to, uh, you know, to, to get up at the sound of an alarm clock every day. I wake Same. up, I wake up naturally, you know. Um, We're very lucky. Yeah. Um, what else? I mean, I, in terms of anti-aging or longevity, I try to surround myself with youthful individuals, you know, smart, bright, talented, youthful individuals. So uh, I, I feel like over the years, I've, that's a skill that I've learned about how to put on these filters and say, you know, this I want this person in my life and I want to spend time with this person. This other person that I thought I used to like, you know, we don't resonate well or whatever and it's not worth the emotional energy to to try and maintain the relationship. So Mm. I'm very, I I curate relationships now better than I ever have in my life. Well, that Harvard longevity study, right? That 80 year long, the Harvard study of adult development, right? Found that social connection is like the most important variable when it comes to living long and healthily. Absolutely. And, you know, and and then I know my next door neighbor, Dan Buettner, uh, Blue Zones Dan. He's your neighbor. He's my downstairs neighbor, yeah. Uh, you know, he will say the same thing, that social connection is, is uh, I, you know, I don't, I'm not sure that he would say that's the number one, but it's right up there in terms of longevity, in terms of the, the centenarians. Along with a plant-based diet, according well, to him, probably. Well, and a cup of beans a day, so don't, <laughs> don't get me started. Dan, love you, man. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, so, so social connection, uh, family connection. Uh, I now have... Um, my daughter has two children of her own, so I'm a grandfather. Mazel tov. Uh, thanks. I don't go by grandpa, though. I go by poppy. Poppy. I had to be sure not to go by <laughs> grandpa. Uh, and uh, so there's that element of, of social connection, of family. Um, but absolutely. Uh, it, I, you know, so that's, that's another area that I think people tend to overlook, and they tend to be tempted uh, to get on their devices and, and think that that's connection, right? You know, mm. how many... How many, uh, how many uh, text conversations can you hold simultaneously? I see this going on. I see people texting, you know, different people at the same time. It's, it's just, uh, it's bizarre to me. Yeah. How do you strike a balance? I mean, you're, you're active. You're active yeah. on social media. You've got a, a thriving business, a large, you know, you've got a big digital footprint. Yeah. Yeah. So how are you able to strike a balance? Well, I have a team. So I have a research team. I have a writing team. I have, you know, people who are able to um, uh, answer uh, some of the easy questions, you know, that that come in if I get, uh, you know, if I get asked certain things. Must so, be nice. Well, it's no, it's great. <laughs> no, and it's, no, but it it it's also that's that sort of um, um, ability to um, you know prioritize relationships. So I I can't afford to be answering, for instance, on um, on uh, say X formerly known as Twitter, <laughs> uh, you know, every question that comes my way. But I am, uh, you know, I'd, I'd rather spend quality time. I'm, I'm also, I don't text. So I text a little bit, but I would rather talk to somebody. I'd rather pick, you know, hear a voice and have a conversation uh, than be doing this, you know, texting back and forth, which some people assume is apparently the only way, texting is the only way to go now. Yeah. So much gets lost. in the. End I sat in the car for 10 minutes wondering whether I should text you that I'm here. <laughs> Or, or call you. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad you texted. Yeah. 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 It's because it's, I feel like for, for people that have like grown up where the internet has kind of cross wired into their brains, like it has mine, it's, um, Texting is great for when you're, you know, coordinating and you're just passing information yeah. from one, you know, from one vector to another. Um, so, yeah, very useful. But I completely agree that the art of, of having a phone conversation is something that is seem, has seemingly been lost on younger generations. I mean, the heart, art of having a conversation is being lost. In which general, is, yeah. Which I, I, I'm, I'm sad that that's where we're headed, I think. I mean, I, I look at um, some of these uh, comedians... My favorite comedians are the ones who are who tell the best stories, and the stories are what connects with the audience. Um, and I think that that's the, the ability to tell a story and to impart color to information, whether it's a joke or whether it's a historical thing or whether it's just an emotional um, discussion you're having with another person. The ability to, to 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 dig deeply into the the nuance and the color of of what's going on emotionally is such an important part of human connection and and. I feel sometimes like that's being lost. I certainly see it um, being lost in some of the writing that mm. I that I read, you know, from from other people. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Have you been able to avert the seemingly inevitable accumulation of belly fat? This is something we talked recently. We had a, a yeah. wonderful expert on the show. We did a whole two hour long episode about visceral fat, the dangers yeah. of visceral fat, and seemingly you look at any forty year old, fifty year old, it's like dad bod city. Yeah. And it's like super common, but you, seventy years old, still have a six pack. <laughs> how do you how do you do it? Again, I think some of it's genetics. Um, I think some of it is uh, my uh, history of uh, muscle memory, if you will, my history of having worked out and having um, had that be part of my life. When I tell people to move around a lot at a low level of activity, when I say find ways to move and walk, um, I do a lot of that. So I'm always. Uh, doing something that um, is engaging metabolic tissue that's burning off body fat. So I don't count calories really, but I do notice that uh, between my eating choices, which are largely either carnivore or keto-ish, combined with some amount of intermittent fasting, so I go 18 hours most days without eating anything, and I literally can visualize my body using body fat as energy through those hours that I'm not consuming calories. Um, I think going, uh, I think the sprinting, which we just talked about, is one of those areas that really ramps up the metabolism sufficiently and then it has long lasting effects. So I can, I sprint once or twice a week um, pretty hard and I usually I do it on a fat bike and that's my new my new favorite kind of uh, exercise mode. Like on the beach? Yeah, on the beach, on the mm-hmm. sand. Uh, I, I rode this morning. It was incredible. I mean, wow. I, I, and you don't really see anybody riding on the beach in Santa Monica. Um, I ride in Miami almost all the time, t- twice a week, but I ride on the sand 12 miles, 15 miles on the sand. Um, the sand in, in California, particularly Santa Monica, is very fine and very difficult to do. So I ride at low tide. I wait for low tide, and then it's just enough of a um, of uh, friction hmm. and uh, resistance on the sand to get a great workout, but I go hard and and so when I say I move around a lot at a low level of activity, a couple of times a week I do an hour to an hour and a half of I would say zone. If you're talking about zones, right? Most of the work I do is at zone two, but I might do three hours a week at between zone four and five, uh, and that's a high level of intensity. And because I become metabolically efficient and metabolically flexible through my diet and through the choices of exercise that I do, I just burn fat at a higher rate of output than most people who never develop that skill, if you will. Hmm. So it's it's nothing conscious that I do. It's just um, I'm, I'm always burning off my stored body fat, so I don't store fat. Uh, and I'm conscious that I don't overeat. And I, when I say conscious, it's not like I'm like, oh, God, I better not overeat. It's, it's oh, I'm no longer hungry for the next bite. It's a very simple, intuitive uh, ability to push a plate away and say, that's enough. Hmm. You know, so I, you know, we talked about this, on, I think, on the last show that, you know, so many people overeat. And whether or not they can get away with it, some people can get away with overeating and it never shows on them. But they still probably eat 30 or 40 percent more calories than they actually need to thrive. So I'm someone who's who's found that area that I don't really overeat, 
um, much. And if I do, I I feel it and it doesn't feel good. And I just you know, can yeah. chalk that up to experience and I'm not going to do that again. Well, I feel like most people, most lean people have, there's a degree of checks and balances, whether conscious or not. You might overeat one day of the week, for yeah. example, but then the next day you're like, well, maybe I should exert a little no, more it, energy. And it, and it works that way with me a lot. If there's a day where I've, I've overconsumed, it's not even a conscious decision. It's, it's sometimes a subconscious decision that the next day I don't feel compelled to want to eat that much. Hmm. Uh, and again, if you've developed metabolic flexibility and you can burn your stored body fat any point in time, uh, it, then you, you really never get the hunger pangs or the cravings or the appetite that sort of creeps up on you based on what time it is. You know, some people like, uh, you know, their, their lives are orchestrated around mealtime. Hmm. You know, can't do that at 1230. That's when I eat lunch, right? And it's like, okay, I mean, uh, that's, not, that's just not how my body works, and I've trained it to do that. And that's what I spend a lot of my uh life educating other people in how to acquire that kind of a skill. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. What does Marxism eat in a day? Like walk me through a day of eating for you. Um, so I have a coffee every morning and and people would say, well, that's that's breaking a fast. I'm not, not really. It's no no solid food. It's coffee. It's it's one cup. It gets me going. It, I enjoy it. It's what I, while I'm doing my spelling bee or my crossword or my Sudokus or any of the mental work that I do for almost 45 minutes every day. Do you do those things because you enjoy it or do you do it for a more deliberate reason, I, I brain totally, training, et cetera? I, I totally enjoy it. So I started doing it for the discipline and the brain training. And now it's like I'm compelled to want to do them. You know, I can't, I can't, you know, start the day without doing the Wordle first. And then, you know, and then there are all these, there's probably eight puzzles I do in a day that, um, you know, I find, again, they're they're fun. They're challenging, and I know I'm doing something you know good for my brain. So anyway, coffee is part of that um, routine, that, that experience. Uh, and then I I work out fasted every day around uh, not between nine thirty and and eleven. At some point, I'll find a time to break from writing or or phone calls uh, and do a workout. And sometimes it's a hard workout. Sometimes it's a it's a it's a hour and a half brutal in the sun of in the heat of Miami Beach, um, but the fact that it's fast, it has no negative impact on me. Uh, and then around 1 o'clock, usually 1, 1.30, I'll have my first meal of the day. Um, today, after my ride on the beach this morning, I did like a, I did a salad with some steak that was left over from last night. Mm. Uh, it's not even a big meal. It's uh, probably, you know, I would say 35 or 40 grams of protein and some, and some uh, vegetables thrown in there. Um, and then I'm having some element, chocolate caramel salted element. It's amazing. It's pretty good, it's, right? No, it's really good. And I mean, I you know, uh, those guys at Element are good friends of both of ours. And I love what they've done here. And excuse me while I take a sip. Drinking it hot. I've also mixed uh, about 10 grams of Bub's collagen into, yeah. the, into the mix, yeah. which uh, I heard you talking about collagen and how much you, you appreciate collagen, especially now. Yeah. Uh, I was listening to an interview that you did with our mutual friend Thomas DeLauer, and you were talking about the benefits of collagen. Well, I, I've been a big fan of collagen for a long time. Um, I've even uh, suggested that it ought to be considered a fourth macronutrient. There should be fat, protein, carbohydrate, and collagen. Interesting. Collagen is not the same as, it's not the same amino acid set complement as as muscle building protein is, uh, say, for instance, whey protein or, or casein. Um, I had a bad series of uh, um, tendinosis uh, experiences about 15 years ago. I thought I was never going to sprint again. I got really crusty tendon. Uh, tendinosis is a is a basically dead tissue in the tendon, and um, this was in the Achilles. And uh, every, like every time I step off a of a landing of a foot high, I thought I was going to snap my 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 Achilles. Oh my God. Yeah, and I was supposed to get surgery for it, get it all scraped down, and um, and and you know be in a cast for uh, three months, and then do nine months of rehab, and maybe I'd get back to eighty five percent of where I was. And I'm like, screw that! I, I went on my own little um, research project and realized that I hadn't been getting any sort of collagen raw materials for years. I'm you know I'm I, I'm as a carnivore, I ate the choice cuts of meat. I wasn't really that into bone broth. I didn't 
eat Jello because Jello was sort of off the menu for a long time because of the sugar content. So there were, I was realizing that I had no uh, none of these raw materials that the body needs to rebuild um, connective tissue like tendons and ligaments and fascia and and cartilage. So I supplemented with about 30 to 40 grams of collagen a day for four months and completely healed my tendinosis. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it was like, it was amazing to me. So I'm like, okay, I'm really, I'm onto something here. This is this is something that um, everybody ought to be aware of, that if you haven't been conscious of eating the nether parts of animals, right, if you haven't gotten those collagenous, gelatinous materials from either bone broth or chicken stock or the skin of chicken or the skin of fish or eat chewing on the on the connective tissue of, of regular meat, then you've been missing out on this raw material. And it may, it, it, like my thesis is that explains a lot of the ACL tears, the MCL tears, the, all the stuff that happens in professional sports now. Um, so anyway, so I'm, yes, so yes, I'm a fan of collagen and I try to get some every day. Man. Okay. So going back to your, I want to go back to what, what you eat in a day. So do you, so it sounds like you push your first meal, your first protein bolus, if you will, pretty yes. late in the day. Yeah. You don't see value in eating a big, you know, protein rich meal soon after you wake up to I, halt that like overnight muscle yeah, protein I don't, breakdown. You know, it's, what's interesting is um, I, I've got to the point where I don't feel um, compelled to want to eat three meals a day. So my choices are like if I'm in Europe, if, if I'm on the road, I'll eat breakfast a lot of times and then I won't eat until dinner. So it's still two meals in a day. I don't have the compressed eating window, but it's still only two meals. Um, I've toyed with the idea of starting uh, maybe a 60-day experiment of doing that, of having having a bolus of protein in the morning and again at, at uh, midday and again at the end of the day. But I, I usually have a huge steak at the end of the day. So I'm, I'm getting 60 to 80 grams of protein at the end of the day in a either a steak or a fish or double lobster or, you know, something that I, I make, I make my dinner time meal, my really the sort of focal meal of the day. That's mm-hmm. the one I'm, that's got the most ceremony behind it. I, I, I want to enjoy it. I want to sit down and enjoy it. Um, a lot of times lunch for me is just like, get it out of the way and get, get the fuel in there and, yeah. and get on with the rest of your day, which is one of the reasons I don't, maybe I don't have breakfast. I'm like, I want to get, get on with the day uh, and not, and, and, you know, like my, my writing partner, Brad Kearns, he, he went back to having a protein shake in the morning and he feels great as a result of it. Hmm. So it is a, it is interesting and it is, you know, uh, I think evidence that everybody responds differently to um, different amounts of protein at different times of day and, and uh, different eating windows. Um, so like, what do you, what's your standard? Yeah. I mean, I, I used to do like a fasted workout, um, but I've recently, uh, I've recently started eating like carbs, carbs and, and protein pre-workout in the morning. Yeah. Not a huge meal, probably. I mean, I've audited the protein content and the calorie content. So like a 400, 500 calorie meal with about 40 grams of protein, 30 minutes to an hour after I wake up. And then 30 minutes after that, I'm in the gym. Mm. And I've found I've seen benefit from from you know fueling my morning workouts with some additional carbohydrate Great. beforehand. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would argue that um, that the the carbs that you consume um, in advance of a workout aren't going to necessarily you you you're, you're having rested overnight has allowed your muscles to fill with glycogen, whether or not you carbo loaded the day before. Yeah. So any amount of carbs that you consume pre workout. You know, at any one point in time, you only have about five grams of glucose in your entire bloodstream, so you're not really contributing to the glucose content of the or glucose requirements, if you will, of the hmm. of the workout. Um, and again, you're, if you're adding to the glycogen, you already have enough glycogen to get through even a glycolytic workout. Yeah. Uh, if you've had carbs at dinner, for example, the, the night prior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or just, even if you fasted the day before, your body still makes it still makes glycogen. There's hmm. still a a glyconeogenesis in the absence of any uh, real food coming in. It's not a huge amount, but um, it's it's enough that, like the muscles never really deplete of glycogen. Uh, they, they we used to talk about marathon runners hitting the wall because you ran out of glycogen in your muscles. Well, you didn't really run out of glycogen. You went from maybe 500 total grams of glycogen in all your muscles uh, to maybe 175 below which it would not go because that would you'd suffer sort of 
um, irreparable damage maybe to the muscles from there. So at that point of 175, you still have glycogen left, but it was the brain that said, hey, there's not enough. You know, we the brain and the lack of glucose hmm. would say, okay, time to pull over the road, uh, side of the road, take a nap. How we circumvent that now is with uh, – uh, fat training with keto adaptation and then now ketone supplements. So endurance athletes can circumvent that brain, that central governor that is the brain that tells you to want to stop and maybe pull over and, and, and cut back. We can bypass that with ketones where the brain goes, ah, this is great. We, let's keep going. You know, we, we got we can burn fat all day long because if you're, yeah. if you're keto adapted, you're fat adapted. So you can, you can be outputting at 85 to 90% of your max effort and still be burning largely fats in in, ter- in terms of the muscle combustion. Are you talking effort in, as a, like for an endurance athlete yeah. or for, see, cause I, I feel like there from a, obviously there's different ways of working out and people have different goals. I feel like for me at this point, I'm very, I've been very focused on like muscle hypertrophy, getting jacked, lifting as much weight as I can. And so for, you know, there's evidence that shows that very low carb diets, keto diets, are not as optimal from the standpoint of hypertrophy as compared to like diets with carbs in them. And I would agree with that. Yeah, and one of the reasons is that hypertrophy, um, the the muscles are holding carbs. So when you carb load for every gram of of glycogen that your muscles take in, and and uh, in terms of carbo loading, you store uh, f- four grams of water. So that's the, the hypertrophy comes somewhat from that, right? Hmm. Um, the other part of that, I think, equation is that if you were going to lift every single day, then I'd say, uh, uh, first of all, if you're able to do that, you're probably on the juice, which is fine. Well, no, I try to no lift ju- every... No yeah. judgment. But if, you, but if you lift every day, um, you know, that's, some of the old school bodybuilders would say they would do legs twice a month. Twice a month. Because, because in order to do the work to create the damage and then recover from it in a way that you, you got the hypertrophy we're talking about, you couldn't do it every day. You couldn't <laughs> do it every week. You know, Tom Platts was famous for that. Interesting. So back to you wanting to get jacked. Do you have a coach? Do you have somebody who's working with you on this? No, but I've, I've been reading a lot about, you yeah. know, like evidence-based, like ways to optimize hypertrophy. All right, so now I'm going to interview you, Matt. Yeah, so yeah. so what are your what what's your split? What routines are you doing? Okay, so <laughs> I've been doing I've been doing basically a push pull, so push is like chest, triceps, shoulders maybe. Pull um so push one day, pull the next day. Uh the day after that I've been doing I think shoulders, like I've been like doing like a dedicated shoulder day because I want those capped boulder shoulders. And then legs. <laughs> And then I basically just do the whole thing. All right, thing so that's, four, that's, that's a four-day four day split. Uh, four-day split. And then I just repeat. So I'm, yeah. I'm roughly hitting each muscle group at least twice a week. Yeah. And if I Well, feel, if you're doing shoulders, if you're doing shoulders specifically, you're also more. doubling up on that. You're hitting yeah. some of those muscle groups yeah. four times a week. But I feel like they recover. Like, they okay. recover, you know? And, yeah. and if I feel like I'm burnt out, like, if, if I feel like my total systemic fatigue, like, if I need a day off, yeah. regardless of... What you the know, plan was. doms and whatever the plan, yeah. and, or you know, and or the plan. Then I take a day off. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I mean, how does that sound? No, it sounds like a lot of work. It's and it and it sounds like and I again, I don't want to. If it's working for you, and you look jacked and you look, you know, uh, <laughs> Thanks, jacked, Mark. And, jacked and tan, as, <laughs> as uh, Mark Bell would say. Coming from you, means, that means a lot. <laughs> um, but I, would, I just want to be like you. Well, much. I want to look like you when I'm seventy. So. Well. Appreciate that. I'm, uh, you know, so so I only do the work in the gym to enable me to do the fun stuff outside the gym. So I'm not, and I, again, I'm not, uh, because I'm not wanting to set any records, I can't PR on the bench again. I can't PR on a deadlift. I'll just hurt myself. Yeah. So I do what I can to activate the different muscle groups so that when I get on the fat bike on the beach and I go for an hour and 40 minutes with some Nimrod who's trying to out, ride me on the beach we you know it's very competitive when you're out there on, on these things um i can do that and but and and then i'm applying all the work i did in the gym to uh, a long uh distance event hmm. but i might only do that at most twice a week sometimes once a week then on a in an alternate day maybe three or four days later i might go on a, a stand-up paddle again i'm applying uh all the work i've done with shoulders with triceps to um an event, a sport, 
that I'm just straight ahead paddling rhythmically but hard for an hour and 10 to an hour and 20 minutes doing that. So I'll do maybe three times a week, I'll do either two, two rides and a paddle or two paddles and a ride or something like that. And those are how I apply the work I do in the gym to uh, sports or to real life experiences. Because just doing the stuff in the gym, uh, first of all, it just, it just stop, you stop getting the benefits at some point. And then you're just, unless you're trying to be so creative and recreating a routine and trying to, you know, as Tony, my friend Tony Horton would say, create muscle confusion, <laughs> you know, um, the, then it becomes, the, you know, the, what, what's the end result that you're trying to achieve? I'm trying to achieve having fun when I move, hmm. having fun in my workouts. So the stuff I do in the gym isn't necessarily fun, but it's contemplated to help let me have fun when I'm riding uh, in the sand with friends or if I'm paddling among the dolphins and the manatees in Florida. So th th does that make sense? It's yeah. Like, you know, like I played ultimate frisbee. For you, resistance training is facilitative yes. to your life. Yeah. It's so that you can stay it's mobile. It's not the so end you... goal of, of, yeah. of, the re of, the, of the workout. The goal of the workout is to be able to do other stuff in life. Yeah. Uh, whether it's running upstairs or going on a, like I never, I don't run. I haven't run for, I haven't run a mile for probably 25 years, but I go on eight, 10 mile hikes where I'm hiking hard and fast. And then if there's a flat space of maybe 200 yards, I'll run it hmm. and then I'll hike again and I'll run it. And I don't train to do that except, except that the other things I do in my life allow me to be able to do that. So it's not like I train to be a 10K runner and then I can do the trails, or it's not like I train to be a trail runner. It's like I want to be able to, when I hit the trails uh, on occasion, because there are no trails in Florida, right? There's none in, worth noting. But when I go to Europe in the summer, I want to be able to do 2,000 feet of climbing and do it fast and hard. So all the stuff I do in the gym and on the bike and paddling allows me, they sort of are synergistic and let me do a lot of other things too. Mm. And that may be the, the best explanation of, of the body or the physique that I have right now because I do enough uh, what you would call cross training to, to hit all body parts, not just in terms of hypertrophy, but in terms of power and in terms of um, um, anaerobic uh, capacity, aerobic capacity, and things like that. It sounds very balanced. It yeah. Sounds very yeah. healthy. I and feel like it's it's the most balanced it's ever been in my life. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, and it's a testament to you know the different goals that people have and the different goals that one might have across the age spectrum. Yeah, like for me right now, I just want to look like Thomas Delauer. Okay, you know, yes, it's or even like a fraction. No, it's no, it's a great goal, and Thomas worked hard, has worked hard, and still does. Works yeah. really hard to do yeah. that. Yeah. I'm kidding. He, I mean, no, he's got a phenomenal. You know, I, I'm actually very happy with the, the progress that I've made. I don't, you know, but I, I enjoy, I enjoy that journey. I enjoy getting. Well, that's the most important aspect of all of this: the fact that you enjoy it. Love it. Now, now, what's going to happen is this is going to be a part of your life that that you won't let slide. Not mm. that you let it slide before. But I tell people, look, by the time you turn 40, um, your number one job is to be fit and healthy. You may go to work and earn money, but your number one job is to be healthy. Hmm. And if you don't pay attention to that, it gets away from you awfully fast. So people say, well, I, I'd like to be healthy, but I'm too busy you know, making money. Uh, that's, that's, I think, uh, messed up priorities there. Yeah. yeah. I think I like, I love training as an activity and as a practice or sport unto itself. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been into bodybuilding for as, for as long as I can remember, although I've never aspired to be a quote unquote bodybuilder per se. Um, but I, I, you know, as somebody who, I don't think that I have particularly good genetics. I've never been an athlete, but learning more about the differences between training and exercise, you know, yeah. now I go to the gym, I feel like to train and I've really dialed in my training just reading studies right. and following evidence, you know, people in the evidence-based like bodybuilding world. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I've seen like tremendous progress and that has served as, as its own sort of, sure, it's motivated. you know, decades into, by the way, fitness for me. I mean, mm -hmm. I've, you know, I started training when I was, or working out when I was in high school, you know, I feel like I have this like over the past year, this renewed passion for it just because it's, I've gotten it so dialed in. That's great. I, I mean, I wish that for everybody. Yeah. It's oh. fun. It's super fun. Well, you've been in this, you've been doing this for such a long time where, let's just say over the past 10 years, have you evolved? Like what were, what are some of the 
bigger areas where you've evolved your perspective? Well, the, the, I think the biggest area is I've, uh, I've allowed walking back into my life, hmm. like a lot of walking. I was a runner for years and years. I was a career runner. Um, and during those years, walking was like a waste of like, why would I walk? I, you know, I should run. I should jog wherever I'm going. And I should, um, as I got older, as I got, um, the, as the injuries from the 30 years of running crept, crept up and I could only walk really, um, well, um, I started to appreciate how, what a great exercise walking is and how everyone should do it and how it is the quintessential human activity. Like we, yes, we can run. But we're really born to walk. We're really born to cover long distances bipedally on our feet with with gait that uh, you know that that hits with a uh, heel first and then pushes off the big toe. And every time you do that, it should strengthen the foot and and increase balance, improve uh, biomechanics, improve um, mobility, range of motion, all these things. And the fact that most people, many people, don't spend enough time walking has them sort of con- constricting into this little, you know, <laughs> like like going back to the, you know, the uh, fetal position. <laughs> um, and so I, uh, re- for me, walking was the big, uh, I went from not walking at all to walking 40 miles a week now sometimes and just enjoying the hell out of it and, and walking with purpose, right? Every time I'm, I'm out there, I'm feeling my, my feet land appropriately i'm feeling the muscles push off and it's got its own new um sensibility sensitivity to it right now and you know i've created this new shoe company basically just to encourage people to want to walk outside with a feeling of being barefoot Mm, what's it called uh peluva peluva yeah so we have we have you know we've created these minimalist shoes that have five toes individual toes articulated so you can feel every every time you step on an uneven surface you want to feel that you want you want the foot to react appropriately with all of the input that you get from the bottom of the foot, um, and um, you want the toes to, to uh, not just splay outwardly, but to, to up and down move with a rock or a stick or a shoot or or whatever it is you're you're, you're stepping on. Um, so that's I would say that's one thing that's changed a lot for me in the last you know decade. Um, I think another thing is this balance. Like I like I'm really balanced now. Like I don't I used to think that if I'm not, um, when I wasn't, couldn't run anymore, I was, I lost my, um, not my mojo, but I was injured and I couldn't run at elite level anymore. I switched to triathlon. So then I was cycling 250 miles a week. And that's Mm -hmm. why I became a great cyclist as a result of that. And then when my son was born, um, and I was kind of over the cycling thing, I was living, um, in Brentwood, and so most of my cycling was up and down PCH. I thought to myself, "This is how I die. I'm going to get hit on on PCH one day on my bike." So I sold my bike and I started inline skating. So for five years, I was all about inline skating. So I skated five, six times a week. I was one of the best inline endurance skaters in LA. And then I got injured doing that. I moved on to the next thing. So you know, then it was stand up paddling for a bunch of years, and all I did was was paddle. So I paddle a couple times a week. Now it's a mixture of all these things. I discovered the fat biking. I paddling. I still play ultimate frisbee once in a while. So I have all the different, um, you know, and, and they all, uh, it's not that they detract from being a single sport athlete. They, in fact, as I said, they, they improve it. The fact that I could almost never hike mountains and then, and then go up and do a eight or 10 mile hike the first day and, you know, kick ass the whole time doing it as a result of all the other things I do. You know, it's a it's a, it's a real sense of of being fit as a human, like hmm. fit for life, not just for one sport. And I've seen people who are fit for one sport completely. You know, I, when I was a runner, I could, they wouldn't let me ski because I might get you know twist a knee. Uh, so you have all of these prohibitions on what you can do if you're a single sport athlete. Interesting. Not anymore. You hmm. know, bring it on. So, At what point? When did you realize that you had this this innate athletic ability? that few others have. It's so funny because I don't think I have an innate athletic ability. You I th- don't? No, I think I'm a, I'm a yeoman. I'm, I'm pretty decent at a number of um, events. Like I was a, you know, I've, I was a marathoner in the 70s and 80s. Um, I finished fifth in the U.S. National Championship Marathon in 1980. That was my, my highest finish. Qualified for the Olympic trials. I was never going to compete in the Olympics, but I qualified for the trials, right? Wow. I had my, um, and then from there I went to, um, triathlon. I probably could have been, if I'd learned how to swim, I, I, I could have been one of the better 
uh, Ironman triathletes because I was a, a good runner, good enough for. I was probably the best runner that ever crossed over to triathlon, yeah. and then I became a great cyclist. I just didn't know how to swim. Did I mean I could swim? Look, I I did the Ironman a couple times, right? But but I, I wasn't a fast swimmer. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm not a great jumper. Um, I was a pole vaulter in high school, but I couldn't get over eleven six. Uh, couldn't get, couldn't get past that. So I, I was okay at a lot of sports, but not, you know, not not world class at any of them. Hmm. Um, I had my twenty three and Me done a couple of years ago. That you know the DNA test, and it came back saying I was fifty fifty seven percent endurance athlete and forty three percent strength athlete. Well, what that meant was that I I didn't have enough of the endurance part to be you know, that, that world-class runner, but enough to, to do well. And I beat, you know, I, I, I'm very clear. I extracted as much from my body as was humanly possible based on, on that, on that breakdown. But what I probably would have been good at is say, um, Spartan races, Hmm. you know, or obstacle courses where I had strength and endurance and could combine the two of them together, but they hadn't been invented yet. So, yeah. yeah. But it's interesting that, because I don't think of myself as, um, you know, as particularly great at any one sport, just adequate at a lot of different sports. And I have fun doing them, which is the main thing. Yeah, but you're being just okay at a given activity. I mean, it's like inconceivable for most civilians. Well, uh, I mean, when you, I mean, when you put it like that, sure. But I have a big engine, so, right? So if I, if my um, heart can produce, uh, you know, can can put through the oxygen and fuel necessary to do any one of these different aerobic activities, it almost doesn't matter what the activity is. I, I had the world record in the mile climb for the Versa Climber back in the early 90s. Um, you know, remember the Versa Climber, that, that climbing machine? I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I was, I was, that, that was probably another one of those things where I was strong enough in the upper body based on my genetics to be able to do the aerobic part of that and also to do the strength part of it mm. and combine the two of them to get, you know, a, a, a record in that event. So crazy. Yeah. What are the, like, the, what kinds of, like, diagnostics do you, do you use at this point to, to assess whether or not you are, I mean, obviously you can look in the mirror and you, you're subjectively, you can assess how you feel on a given day, but any other kinds of, like, diagnostics that you use to gauge how well you're aging um, no, I don't use, I don't use the, the wearable stuff at all. And I don't really do a lot of, um, medical testing, diagnostic you testing. You know, I have, um, I, I see a general practitioner once a year, I get blood work done. It always, you know, comes back pretty much the same range of all the blood work. So there's nothing I would do differently with my diet based on that. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, I, it's basically how do I feel is I wake up in the morning and one of the things about getting older is it, it's get, you get st- stiffer and sore every <laughs> freaking day. And so there's a lot more, you know, stretching and preventative stuff that kind of has to come into play. Otherwise, again, you curl up into that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but that's the, it's the aches and pains that are the real, um, limiting factor. So how do you combat that? I mean, uh, body work. Well, I don't get much body work. I used to, mm-hmm. and I don't really. Uh, I don't. It, I don't res- respond well enough that it's worth the two hours investment in time. You know. Um, no, I, I think how you you don't combat it. It. Somebody said the other day. Uh, I forget who it was. One of our um, you know compadres on the internet who's getting older and said, you know, this is one of those things. Would you rather be uh, fit and sore? Than you know, um, than unfit and and not sore, and uh, it's I think it goes with the territory. So I think the fact that I'm trying to figure out that fine line for myself between how much working out is enough to maintain the muscle mass and how much is too much, such that it breaks down and causes issues. So for me, um, I so I've been t- I I take su- supplemental testosterone. I've been taking TR doing TRT for since I was sixty, so ten years. Um, not a lot, but just enough to you know top things up. And I think what I'm what I'm noticing is that the connective tissue is what is the weakest link. Mm. So when I say I you know I'll wake up with like sore joints or elbows or whatever, it's the day after having lifted, right? So if I'm doing a a, a pull day and I'm using a lot of elbows because I'm doing lat pulls or 
close grip, you know, pull downs or things like that. I notice it in my in my elbows, I, and I might notice it in my shoulders later on. Or if I'm doing, I, I play ultimate uh, ultimate frisbee. I played twice last week. It was probably too much. I probably should have only played once because I, the four days in between was not enough time for my my ankles, the connective tissue in my ankles, to recover from that amount of jumping and sprinting and changing direction. Hmm. You know. So, but it's it's just so. I'm supposed to play tomorrow, and I canceled because I'm like I I don't want to. Even though I could, you know, gut it out and go show up and whatever, I'm like, it's not worth the potential injury, and it's not worth the the, the you know aches and pains that will accompany that. Because you got to, whenever you um, do something that is going to cause the body to maybe shift a little bit, cause the genes to upregulate and build stronger muscle, there's some other part downstream in the kinetic chain that goes, wait, 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 you know, that's too much for me to handle. So you sort of always have a, a weak link in there. Hmm. Have you found that the, that supplementing with collagen? Because, I mean, that's yeah, where that, there that is was, some evidence, right? Sure. No, and that's, and that's I would say that's why I'm still able to do, you know, what I can do. Wow. Those sorts of things. I mean, uh, when I say aches and pains, it doesn't prevent me from going to the gym. It doesn't prevent me from doing the stuff that I want to do. Um, but, you know, I, I played... Uh, frisbee uh, uh, Thanksgiving morning and that was four days after I'd played earlier and it's again it's a tough game and, it, and it's a lot of and I couldn't walk on uh, Friday so the next day which is today I got on my bike and I rode for an hour and 15 minutes hmm. and now I feel better for having ridden you know so I so doing something going through the motions you know working the kinks out that way but again i don't use any any devices to measure any of this stuff it's literally how do i feel and what do i feel like i need to to do to alleviate this pain or to or to give this uh, muscle a, some time off to rest and recover i've heard if you're if you're hungry if you're happy and you're horny. The three H's. <laughs> yeah. Those are that's a pretty good litmus test for just general health. Is there do you think there's as a seventy year old, do you think there's truth to that? I check off all those boxes. <laughs> I love it. I check off all those boxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm the I'm I'm the I'm the happiest I've ever been. I could be the horniest I've ever been, I don't know. But then uh, in terms of hungry, um, I don't you know, I I'm a little bit hungry a lot, but not enough to uh, you know, to, to cause me to jump ship. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you have, if you had no appetite, that would be a red flag. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Very interesting. Are you big, big, aside from collagen, are you a big supplementation guy? Not really. Not anymore. And I was for a while, but, um, I, vitamin D, I'm a, I'm a fan of vitamin D. Again, my, you know, my genetic testing would suggest that I don't convert as well as as I should for the amount of time I spend in the sun. Yeah, like living in Miami, you, yeah. you find the need to supplement with vitamin D. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like, um, it's almost a, uh, increases the need in my estimation. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that and uh, what else do I supplement with? Um, creatine? Do you take creatine? I do take creatine on occasion. Creatine is one of those things that I cycle in and out. So creatine works really well if you're on, uh, like if on your program. If you say, I'm going to spend six weeks and I'm going to ratchet up. Um, my workout so that everything that I can do 10 of today, um, I'll be able to do 11 or 12 of the same weight tomorrow. That's how creatine works. It basically increases. It's, it's in the ATP cycle, so it gives you a little bit more of that instant energy, not the long-term glycogen stuff. So it works for about six weeks, and then, and then it just it doesn't it, – not that it stops working. You stop getting the benefits of it because you've done the work. And so what I would suggest, and I do this, and then I'll cycle off for a couple of months and then get back on. And if you do it right, you, you use the creatine to go from here to here, and then you go off the creatine, and you don't go back to here, you just go back to here. And then you, and then you stay there for a while, and then you reintroduce the creatine, and now you can go from here up to here. Mm. So it, it's, it's been shown to be one of the most, certainly one of the safest, uh, and probably one of the most effective Performance and legal performance enhancing substances that you could take. Yeah, yeah. and and the, the 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 brain benefits now that are coming out in the research. Yeah, yeah, hard to ignore. Yeah, there's. I think for most people, there's no reason not to play around and have some fun with creatine. Hmm. Yeah, I heard somebody. I uh, pulled my Instagram audience. You got a lot of fans that follow me for questions that I might ask you, and they said somebody said that you appeared on a podcast recently with your wife or something, mm -hmm. and they were they, they loved her. She was amazing. 
The what? That they they loved her. Oh, they loved her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, she's great. No, she, we just did another one uh, uh, with Mari Llewellyn. Uh, oh, amazing! Last week. Yeah, and amazing. We, but we did Skinny Confidential a couple of months ago. Oh, cool! That's you know, a, Lauren that's and Michael. One. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, so I did, uh, as I mentioned, I did take some questions from my audience, and yeah. I do want to throw them at you sure. because because um, you are the goat, and uh, and I value any time that we get to spend together. Um, so Krasna Babic, I have no idea how to pronounce this, but the question is, what does he snack on? You a big snacker? No, I'm not a big snacker. No, no. Um, but um, but when I do, like. <clears throat> Macadamia nuts might be one of my favorites, um, and then I I do cheese and crackers uh, with wine before dinner if that counts as a snack. So mm. sometimes at the end of the day, it's around six o'clock or something like that. We're going to eat at seven thirty or whatever. I'll have uh, you know a little wine and cheese and crackers, and that'll be my pre my pre meal meal snack. What, what kind of crackers are you still? Because you're one of the OG paleo guys, Yeah, yeah. Right? So, so these are, um, they're almost always, uh, you know, gluten-free. Um, so uh, whether it's uh, Mary's Gone Crackers or Simple Mills or Hue, uh, they make, all these people make some great, you know, crackers that are just, and it's, it's mostly about the cheese. It's not about the crackers. Yeah. <laughs> Favorite cheese? Um, pfft, you know, so, like some of the soft, smelly cheeses from England, the, you know, the, the brie. Uh, the camembert so brie and all it, uh, the the uh, gorgonzola sometimes yeah mm. love it this question oh this is a super interesting question from b d d d d d d d seventy four how do you balance life enjoyment with healthy eating avoiding orthorexia uh, you know it's it's that's never been an issue although I'll put a caveat there and say I I've, I've been accused of being orthorexic at times but only because I have like this list of foods that I eat. And on that list, I'll eat whatever, whenever. It's not like... So as long as you are willing to exclude certain foods, um, and for me, it's gluten, you know, wheat, it's, it's, it's pies, cakes, candies, cookies, pasta, sweetened beverages, uh, you know, industrial seed oils. It leaves um, meat, fish, fowl, eggs, nuts, seeds, vegetables, a little bit of fruit, some starchy tubers. And the reason I created Primal Kitchen was to have things that you put on those foods that make them interesting and delicious and unique enough that every time you you mix and match that relatively small list of, of healthy foods, it's a great taste experience. So I, I never put anything in my mouth that doesn't taste great. Um, I love to eat. People say, well, you know, you, you know how to push food away and you have all these, you know, rules about, you know, when you're hungry and when you're not hungry. Well, no, but I love to eat. So when I'm going to eat, I want it to be meaningful and, and important. And so if that makes me, you know, somewhat orthorexic, I guess, but, you know, I don't, I don't turn away uh, pumpkin pie at Thanksgiving or, um, you know, one of my favorite foods in the world is uh, um, fruitcake. <laughs> and uh, I have a couple of pieces of that every once in a while. And, you know, I, I just don't, I don't have cheat days. I'm not, I don't incorporate cheat days into my, into my routine, which seems to have been a thing for a while for some people. I think Ferris sort of reintroduced that concept, right? Mm. Um, so, so, so my, I don't see that I am foregoing any hedonistic pleasure, any gustatory pleasure, any, any, any taste stuff that's missing out in my life, I just don't, it doesn't, that doesn't jive with me. I, I, I feel like I'm eating exactly what I want when I want to eat it, and it tastes great. Yeah, 100%. 100%. I feel the exact same way. And there's no, I mean, the there's no dietary pattern that's more disordered than the standard American dietary pattern, yeah. which is upwards of 60% by calories. Dude, I, I was driving here today, and I, and I go past this donut shop. <laughs> Like a no-name donut shop, and there's a line out the door mm. of people at two o'clock in the afternoon going to get donuts. I'm like, and and that, and I just remind myself that's a lot of people. In Deep the, fried in, dough, yes, in, in refined, bleached, and deodorized seed oils that have been sitting in that fr fryer probably yes. for hours at they, temperature, months. months. They, they, they don't they don't change those oils out. 
No. They don't take you. Somebody comes once a month and takes the sludge out of the bottom, and that's when the oil gets changed. Is that months? Is that, it could be. I don't know. Whoa. It's, it's, yeah. I mean, days for yeah, sure. Days for sure, yeah. Well, I've, I've posted on my Instagram, and I got people, because you know, like at this point, people follow me. They, they yeah. work in fast food. They're like, yeah, I mean, the regulations are to change those oils every day, maybe. Yeah. yeah. But we don't. Yeah. Like, we're underpaid yes, and overworked. Like, yeah. we don't change them, you know? It's crazy. No, but I, to, to that point, you know, I had a restaurant for a hot minute in Culver City. And it was all about the grease trap. You had to get a permit for a grease trap, right? And that's where, that's how the oils get, um, you know, that, that's when, they, when, when they, they can't let any grease go down the sewer, so they have to trap it. And so there's a lot of this stuff that never makes it as far as the grease trap. Um, and the permitting for the grease trap was such that we had to change it out. We had to, we had to come, they had to come, you know, do it every day to, to get rid of that sludge collection Ugh. that they had. It was, yeah. It was, that's nuts. Yeah. I think that that's really where the big, that's where the, the whole seed oil debate becomes particularly um, black and white for me is that, you know, in the setting of the fryer, the yeah. restaurant fryer is when those oil, you really want to do your best to avoid those oils, yeah. right? Yeah. I think if a little bit sneaks in here and there, probably not a big deal. Dose makes the poison. Yeah. Um, but in the setting of, of, you know, those oils being kept at temperature allowed to generate all those harmful aldehydes and the like, I think yeah. that's where it becomes really bad. Yeah. It's just a free radical soup, a free radical soup. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Wow. What a, what a powerful way to, yeah, that's exactly what it is. And I agree with the whole balance thing. Like I've, I've eaten a, pr- a primarily gluten-free diet for the past decade, I would say, but I've allowed like, especially as of late the occasional sourdough bread, especially when I'm traveling and you get some of that like good artisanal European bread. Yes, it's amazing. To come in. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Can't be dogmatic. You know, I think that's a that's not the way to live. Um all right, let's take one more. Oh, somebody asked, how do you manage the stiffness and aches which seem to come with age? We've well, talked about that. We just talked about it, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Somebody saying. Somebody asks, "How do you how to age like fine wine?" Apparently, you're aging like a fine wine. <laughs> uh, Would you corroborate that? Do you think you're aging like a? Do you do you? I mean, are there is there anywhere where you you wish that you could like improve or, you know? Oh God! I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, you know I um, spend too much time out in the sun, and uh, you know my my skin reflects that. Hmm. Um, would I do it over again? I'm, I'm not sure I would. I wouldn't change things doing it over again because I love spending time out in the sun. I love spending time on the water, um, you know, running with my shirt off, uh, you know, working outside, whatever it is. Um, but I would say that that's that the effects of, of sun, particularly on, on the face, are pretty significant, especially for endurance athletes. If you look at all of the, the cont- my contemporaries from the triathlon days, the uh, advanced aging on the face is pretty, hmm. uh, pretty compelling. Uh, from the dehydration, from the squinting in the sun, from the you know from the salt whatever, and just the pure time in the sun. Um, I, again, I I think sleep, uh, you know, eating right, yeah. uh, making sure you move all the time. Like moving is 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 the big thing. And to the question that just came up that I answered about the aches, this this stiffness and the aches. Moving is part of that thing. So the, the, the stiffer I am and the achier I am, the more I need to go walk, right? And the need, and I literally will move, you know, do some shoulder rolls while I'm walking. And when I say walking, not 10 minutes, but for an hour, an hour and 20 minutes, and just getting out there and going through, going through the motions and lubricating the joints and getting back into, um, you know, a, uh, a flow that somehow got disrupted because of a game I was playing or some intensity of an activity that I was engaged in. Yeah. Do you ever ruck? Yeah. I have a, um, a, a pack at home. I don't, I have a 20 pound vest, hmm. right? So I don't. Basically, I, rucking is like basically walking with a weighted vest or backpack. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Backpack. Yeah. 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 So I don't do the backpack, but I have, I have a vest and I got that in Miami because there's no hills in Miami. So I needed to have something like that. And, and, you know, there's like once in a while, if, if it's late in the day and I haven't walked much or I, I feel like I need to, I'll walk backwards up a treadmill. Oh, cool. Right? So at 15-degree incline, again, with my with my paluvas on, with my special shoes on, and I can feel the push-off. I can feel the tibialis getting engaged. I can feel all the cool stuff that, mm. that Ben Patrick, Knees Over Toes guy, talks yeah. about, you know. Um, or just walking on a treadmill with a, with a weight vest. Uh, it's a great – people say, well, again, how can walking compare to running? Running is so much better for you. It's, you get so much more done running. 
You actually don't. Most people, almost everybody you know, cannot run twice as fast as they can walk. So running isn't that efficient. If you can't even run twice as fast as you can walk, why not walk? And running courts injuries. 50% of runners get injured every year. Like 32% of the NFL players get injured every year. 50% of runners get injured every year. Walking doesn't court injury at all. Walking is what injured runners do to recover. Hmm. So everything about walking is sort of anabolic recovery, beneficial. Running is catabolic, injury promoting, uh, and doesn't, at the end of the day, doesn't even really um, you know, create that much of a of a uh, aerobic effect that you can't recreate through rucking with a backpack or walking uphill on a treadmill or hiking on trails or any number of other you know ways in which you can incorporate walking in a in a in a manner that is conducive to not just fitness but health as well. Mm. I love to. I mean, that's like music to my ears because I personally really dislike running. I mean, I do it occasionally. And there have been times in my life when I've been kind of in, in a, a, a rhythm of sorts with it. But in general, yeah, I vastly prefer walking. So I think a lot of people run, you know, they hate it and they love to hate it. And they do it because it's, you know, we, I think it's important that we do something every day that, that scares us, right? That, that's that old line about do something every day that makes you afraid or scares you. Um, and for me, um, it's not that working out scares me, but I do something every day that I'm like... Um, all right, this is going to take, whether it's a cold plunge, like I don't, I don't think anybody loves getting in the cold plunge, right? But if it's going to, if that's the thing it takes to get you scared and overcome that and set you on a track for the day, great, do that, you know? Uh, it's a hormetic experience. Um, leg days at the gym. Like, I don't know how many people, if you really do a good leg day, if you do a real leg day, how many people are like, yes, today's leg day, I can't wait, you know? <laughs> that's it for me. That, that was my today. Today today was leg day. Yeah. Yeah. And? It's like a spiritual practice almost. Yeah. It's like when you see somebody with strong legs, they likely also have a, a, a mindset to go with that. Yes. Like a, a mindset of strength and growth. Yes. And... Um, there's always there's a memes all over the internet with the guys with the big chest and shoulders. He skipped leg day. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No leg day. I've I've definitely got a newfound appreciation for it. I've been hitting it pretty hard. Yeah. Um, which is difficult for me because I have like low back issues, and so I just gotta be careful. Just gotta be careful. Yeah. Don't yeah. you know if you're doing a hex bar deadlift instead of a regular you know regular deadlift stuff like that. Uh, that's that's how you get around that. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah. Yeah, love it. Dude, always great getting a jam with you. Super fun. Thanks for coming in. Oh, thanks for having me, Max. Great yeah. to see you. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here, and I'll see you there.